So uh, we're going to start the next segment, which is the production and planting segment, and we're going to have Tom Bowman from the University of Simon Fraser come up. And Fraser the University of Fraser Valley, sorry, in British Columbia come up. And he is going to talk about field production and planting density for the plastic culture system. My dean was wondering if I had hired on a different university when they read that outline. Uh, I was with Simon Fraser University, all of a sudden. It is the University of the Fraser Valley that I work at as a horticulturist. I do a heck of a lot of other things. Um, one of the growers I most of the time work with, Alf Krauss is here, he'll speak later. He'll catch the mistakes in my talk. I just wish I knew the drugs Clark is on, because uh, I did extremely well uh, despite them. And so I'm, I'm going to exchange cards with you later. Um, we're growing some other drugs, as does Oregon and Washington now, and I get uh, about 10 requests for those, for that stuff, uh, rather than for strawberries or blueberries. Uh, what I want to talk about is <coughs> I'm going to talk about uh, the field preparation and the plant density in the system. Can you hear me in the back <laughs> this way? Okay, I, I hate sticking to the microphone. I always feel like swallowing them because I'm too close to them. Um, I have uh, some comments on the data that Clark provided, uh, our data is uh, quite a bit different, not just because of the 10% diff difference of the dollar, but uh, our labor costs are a little bit higher than yours, are, or greatly higher. So for us uh, to grow the matter row system these days uh, for a process crop, uh, you break even. So it, it is something you can consider for labor, to keep your labor happy, uh, but other than that, there's really no market in it, and that's why our industry actually, the processing industry, completely collapsed. And I'm here to speak about our experience with switching over to uh, the fresh market. So, uh, our industry is tidy uh, when it comes to, we, we used to have 15 million pounds of production for process, 9 million pounds of production for process in British Columbia alone, uh, never mind the rest of Canada. The rest of Canada doesn't do anything process really, it's just fresh market uh, on uh, the, the East Coast and in Central Canada, which is Ontario and Quebec. Uh, we, when you ask me today about exact numbers, uh, how much we produce, and processing, I'll tell you, diddly squat is the number, that's the exact number. Uh, it's absolutely irrelevant. Uh, we purchase fruit now for those processors that require the fruit for uh, processing market. We work together, we've got a whole network similar to you, it's just differently structured. We have the BC Ministry of Agriculture, and we've, which is uh, for you the state, for us the province. Uh, and Agriculture Canada is the federal agency, uh, sort of like the USDA. Um, the University and the BC Strawberry Growers Association are working together, and my role within that is research and coordination, field tours, talks, and a little bit of extension service. Uh, my job at the university is one that could be best described as teaching only. Did I pass on that fantastic slide? There you go. If we had strawberry like this all the time, especially presented like this, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here. People would be lining up at our door. And this is what I want to hammer uh, home uh, today in every single one of my talks. It's the quality. Quality, quality, and the quality. And you have to look at the varieties to fit that quality that people want. When I first arrived in the United States in 1983 for the first time, uh, I was told, it doesn't matter uh, what a strawberry uh, tastes like, the main thing is it looks good and it's hard like a rock so it travels very well because people will just put ice cream over top of it. Well, I disagree. 
I think, the people of the United States, too, just like in Canada, have, uh, are a little bit more distinguished in the flavor. Uh, they drink wine. Otherwise, they would never drink wine. They would just uh, get grape juice and put some ice cream on it, too. Um, so, to wrap up the history, we have transferred all of our growing. We've gotten much, much smaller, as the numbers show uh, on the plants that are being sold. And the variety mix has gone along with that. When you look at the numbers of the variety mix, Pat uh, Moore always puts that together nicely for us. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and that's reported from the different nurseries. It shows clearly what the varieties <coughs> are. Um, and the processing varieties have vanished out of our mix or, or have become insignificant. And the fresh market varieties have gone up. And yes, flavor. We do want flavor in them. It is essential. People now in the interior, uh, again, just like here, you go across the first set of mountains and you have the drier regions and the hotter regions. In the interior, people are buying strawberries fresh, actually, by variety. Sort of like your Cabernet Sauvignon and the other different wines. So the varietals, uh, it's starting to be very important to advertise um, with what variety you actually have. So, uh, out of season production has become important to us because strawberries can draw consumers in and they will buy other crops. Consumers today haven't got the slightest idea of when strawberry season is. They don't know. Those that still come to the farm and pick them themselves may have an inkling, but they are also now looking at uh, out of season production and they're still <coughs> doing fresh marketing. So people are going for Christmas, oh, let's get a basket of strawberries. Doesn't matter where it comes from, it could come from the moon, uh, it could have a carbon footprint attached to that that's as big uh, as Mars, it doesn't matter. People will still want the strawberries now. January. Um, somebody has a birthday in January, they still want the strawberries. Yeah. Um, out of season, very, very important. Value added. We're going to hear today a talk by one of your specialists uh, who's going to talk about value added um, crops and how they look, etc. It's like in our lumber deal. Lumber in British Columbia always gets sold as lumber. We, we sell entire trees. We sell them to Japan, we sell them to you, we sell them to all over the world as trees. Well, why don't we make furniture? And it's the same thing with this. Why don't we make something out of it? Why don't we dip them in chocolate and inject them with alcohol in the middle? You know that little gap in it in between? <laughs> San Francisco, about 10 years ago, I purchased one of those. I paid five US dollars for it. And it was the best thing I've ever eaten. <laughs> so there's added value, you think? Normally you would get about 10 cents for that. Uh, there was five bucks. I'm not sure how much the chocolate was. Chocolate is, uh, you know, start growing uh, cocoa. <laughs> because there's a chocolate shortage. Strategic plan, uh, we as an industry went and produced a strategic plan where we want to go. We didn't do this hopscotch, just like you're holding this seminar today. Uh, we wanted to know where we should be going with this whole thing. So, in strawberries, we're not going to uh, be able to grow for processing anymore. What do we want to grow then? Do we just roll over and die? Do we want to go to a different system and grow fresh fruit? Uh, how do we grow fresh fruit? Well, of course, we're going to grow it in the matter row system, right? Right in the dirt. We're going to pick them, and uh, I have you know that it rains where I come from most of the time during June, which is our strawberry season, in case you have forgotten what the strawberry season is, too. And when it rains, it splatters the soil up, and the fruit is not the high quality that I would like to see on the market. And that's not the fresh fruit that I would like to see in the market. So plasticulture uh, came uh, into uh, the game. 
Uh, I have been spying in California. There's so many Californians here. I don't know if say anything about that. I've been down in California working with them. I consider it one region, California, Washington, Oregon, and BC. It's just one region right around. We have more similarities than I would have with Ontario. I don't ever go to Ontario and work with it. I haven't got the slightest idea. I don't care. This down here, this is where uh, we're all uh, quite similar. <coughs> So uh, they were doing things quite right. Went to Florida, saw how they were doing that. I, I know how they're doing things in Spain and France and Germany, etc. That's where I originally came from. Uh, so collected all these things together and made a few proposals to growers to try these out. And uh, one of the first one was Alf Krauss, who's going to speak later, and uh, about his experience, how he started. Uh, that was a a lot of trial and error. There were some not so good parts. There was some swearing involved once in a while. On my part, not on his part. Mm -hmm. um, but it worked. Plus, we retained the BC reading program. I cannot urge you more in keeping your reading programs, your local reading programs, and the testing in your specific climate. I can't overstate that. It's very important. Every time I get a new variety out of Ontario, or out of Quebec, it fails. Every time. Did you want to add something to that, Shadow? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. So, as for varieties, uh, I've been asked to talk about varieties. That's really boring. Uh, for two bearing varieties, we still grow uh, quite a bit of totem, some of the stolo. Uh, I've been able to suggest that name. Uh, Pat turned around and shook his head on stolo. Uh, please don't try that here. Uh, Puget Reliance, uh, a very good variety uh, for us. Um, Rainier, yes, the whole Rainier, good flavor. Uh, it's been used in breeding all over the place uh, for its flavor, but it's soft. Uh, it doesn't uh, stay on the, on the shelf uh, too long. And we've uh, played around with Clancy and Lamour. And Alfie, you're going to say something about the model, right? Yes, sir. About one of them, at least. Right? Uh, and somebody talked about romance novels. There you go. Clancy and Lamour. <laughs> Um, the neutral varieties. They're, they're the varieties. Um, there's a little bit of an emphasis on that. The first time I got my hands on uh, the Albion, uh, and I had something like 100 plants, and I tasted the first fruit, I'm going like, what is this? Is that a Rainier, or is that something totally different? Is that some, some of that stuff that I pick in the mountains? Uh, well, it wasn't. It's a fantastic variety as far as I'm concerned. It's not too firm. Uh, the, every time I go visit a field day in California, they tell me, what are you talking about? This is very soft. As a variety, I can throw it, somebody killed it with it. And they, they say it's slightly soft. Um, we harvest the variety perfectly fresh for the local fresh market. And that's the ticket. If you pick it, for uh, shipping it from Timbuktu to Chicago, uh, you have to pick it a little bit on the unripe side. If you pick it fresh, it has this developed flavor, it has that sweetness, it's just, to me, it's unbeatable in flavor. There's a new variety, uh, Monterey, and uh, another new variety, uh, what is it, I have it listed here, San Andreas. Uh, both of those outproduce the Albion, but in flavor, the Albion now produces all of them. We did flavor testing at the fruit stand at Krauss Farm, and it, does, it didn't matter what we put in there, totem, this, that, that, and the other, even Rainier or Hood or what have you. It didn't matter what we put in the mix. People would always separate, or separate the Albion. There was just the odd person, and they even looked odd. Uh, that would pick another variety. <laughs> there are some odd people coming to here. Well, 
right? <laughs> so uh, Portola uh, has not done anything for us. Uh, I'm not sure how that will perform here. Uh, I think even California was dropped. Richard, uh, do you do still produce lots of them? Not, well, just in certain regions. Yeah, good, yeah. yeah. But it's not, not had the uh, acceptance as uh, no, uh, uh, Will Monterey and uh, etc. Um, tribute and TriStar are still high in the numbers and I don't understand it. Uh, we, we can produce them quite well in the hot regions. Uh, behind the mountains and the interior valleys, we can produce them, and on Vancouver Island, we can produce Tristar and Tribute. In the Fraser Valley, well, we've got all the. That's why those first three varieties are the best ones. Uh, I can really recommend. If it even that uh, those three varieties also did extremely well in greenhouse culture, and extremely well in tunnel culture, uh, so. There's a lot more uh, to it. Again, I can't stress enough, please don't get your own runner plants. But please don't get them from the neighbor. Get them from a certified nursery. Get certified <laughs> nursery stock. Please do that. I get whatever research we're doing. I usually get them from NorCal, uh, the, the uh, plants, uh, to do the research uh, quite happily with that. Uh, as the culture is concerned, you're going to warn me. Okay, good, excellent. Culture is concerned. In the soil preparation, very important to me is that the pH is right and uh, that the drainage is right. If the drainage isn't right, forget the whole nonsense. And please don't plant blueberries or cranberries in there, because they don't like it either if they're not well drained. So they like moisture, but uh, the drainage is still very important. Raised bed, 12 inches. When it settles, it should be 12 inches high. I like raised beds. They heat up early in the season. They get the plants growing. The root system grows very well. And for us, it's essential. For you, it may not be as essential, depending on your soil. For us, it's essential to keep the plant's roots out of the water during the winter time. Otherwise, we're starting a season without a root system, and it's tough to grow those roots back uh, quickly enough. Uh, the shape of the bed is very important. You can't make it flat. <coughs> if you're doing this in Yakima, yes, you can do that. Because it hardly ever rains there. No overhead irrigation. But you have to put a crown on it so that the water goes off. Because a bear, one of those big Albion berries can weigh up to uh, 40 or even 50 grams. And uh, that actually makes an indentation on the plastic. Uh, and guess what? collects in that indentation. One of our growers tried that with melons once. Uh, that was a disaster. They all rotted away. You lay the plastic and the irrigation all at once in, in one going, uh, which is the most efficient thing. Uh, we talked about drainage already, so I hope we have the drainage in. Uh, trickle tape or drip tape, or whatever, you have under the plastic. No water can touch the plant or the fruit. Again, I'm looking at quality. The plastic has to be strong enough plastic, uh, either embossed or otherwise strong enough plastic, 3 mil or something like that, not flimsy plastic. And don't come with construction type plastic. The stuff has to be uh, UV protected, otherwise it won't last long enough. Marking, I'll probably be talking about how you mark it. Okay, I'll talk about that later. Irrigation system, everybody knows how the irrigation system works. You connect it to a water supply. You have your filter, gauges, etc. Uh, distribution system, I'll talk about that later in the session a little bit. Uh, main line goes out, and then you have your sublines. Uh, we have a, an, enough water to do two acres at once, so it goes automatically. I saw, uh, Clark, I saw in your, I see you left, yeah, uh, in Clark's description, uh, I saw that he a lot of time for the irrigation, please a lot some time for the irrigation, there's always something that needs to be done with a hammer or an axe or something like that. <laughs> it's sometimes frustrating. Okay, here's the big deal, uh, we've tried many different spacings, 
and this is what our system looks like. You're in a different climatic area, so you've got to adopt that. I'm sure uh, the other Tom from W who will follow me here who will talk about this. Uh, we've got a bed. The beds are as far apart as the farm spacing uh, normally is. In this case, it was, uh, I did most of it under 42 inches, but anywhere between 42 and 80, 48 inches apart on center of those raised beds. Uh, we started with 14 inch beds that collapsed down to 12 once the soil had settled, and I need 12. We have two rows, the drip irrigation, trickle irrigation, two rows of plants on the top of that bed. So I'm going to try three rows, another one tried uh, four rows, while the peppers couldn't even reach in there anymore. So uh, be careful with those kind of things. It looks good, it makes good sense. Uh, in numbers because you could potentially be producing more, but uh, it doesn't work from the reaching in, uh, the picking, uh, and it doesn't work from uh, the control of diseases, especially fungi. Uh, so the two rows are 8 inches apart, and the plants within a row are 12 inches apart. And you plant one here, the next one here, the next one here, the next one here. So that's a plant every six inches, just in different rows that are eight inches apart. That is, we figured, how we can stash the most plants into this. This uh, PowerPoint show is made available uh, to you, so don't worry about writing this all down. Uh, I talk more about the uh, fertility later, but this is the important one. When you're pushing the nitrogen, and please don't push it too much, otherwise the food goes up. The calcium needs to go up too. If the calcium isn't there, you will get deficiencies, and the fruit will be malformed, the leaves will crinkle up and do all sorts of nasty things. Uh, plus, your fruit is deteriorating quickly uh, on the shelf, because the cells are actually falling apart. Calcium is a big part of uh, the cell wall, so very important. Uh, I already mentioned the pH, uh, micronutrients important. We all know how to do NPK, but we don't know anything about micronutrients. That's still a mystery. So please keep those um, clear. Let me just finish and I'll get to your question now. Pruning, you know how to do the pruning. Uh, in, in this system, at the end of the year, uh, when I'm either picked with the uh, June bears or finished picking with the day neutrals, we'll go over it and move the plants off. Let them grow back a little bit for winter time and we go in. Most important, runners. Twice a year the runners get removed. We're now relying not on new plants, the baby plants, but we're relying on branch crowns. Weed control. There is very little by hand, and otherwise by chemicals, and I have that somewhere. Plant density, I've explained that to you already. In this system, there's the marker. Alf, you familiar? You made that yourself. You welded it together yourself with bicycle wheels. All sorts of different ways to do this. That's how you lay the plastic. Oops. And that's how the plants. The plants, after two days, the plants already make the first leaf. Unbelievable when they come out of cold storage, by the way. That's what it looks like in the winter. All the water, in this case, the ice shows it better, uh, is in between the rows and not on the plants. And that's where I learned it all from. And that's how you spread. And that's the end of that show. And I think, yeah, yeah, just uh, never mind. You're going to talk about the tunnels, so I won't talk about the tunnels. Do uh, you have a question there? Yes, you mentioned the pH and watching and what you think is the 6.5. Any other quick question?